Broadcasting live from the hybrid plane of Mirrodin, Nuphorexia, and Zelfir, it's Tap Tap Concede! Hello! And this is a very special lore episode. Joining me this week is Cameron. Hmm? And I'm Kathleen, and we are going to go all over the lore of March of the Machine. Um, but before we get to that, a quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsor is, of course, none other than CardKingdom.com, a veritable kingdom of card. Not singular card, though, like March the Machine. Multiple cards. Multiple cards wherever you are and fast shipping processed by union workers. What more could you want? Well, you could want a button. And if you uh, use our affiliate code, which is slash LRR, when you go to Card Kingdom and you say, Ler sent me button, please, when you make your order, you'll get a button. And right now our button says, my deck's power level is yes. So that's great. And you know what else is great? your support and our kind support of our patreon at patreon.com you're the reason that we can do all that we do and uh we really appreciate it because uh part of my job this week that i left myself time to do every day was read magic story hmm. so the magic story for march of the machine is is quite long it is uh 10 main story parts and eight side stories um however i will say that i really liked having this much story it's basically an 18 part story yeah yeah no i agree uh, so spo I'm just going to, if you haven't read it already, spoilers within, if you are planning on reading it, obviously stop this podcast now and come back later. If you're on the fence about reading it, I'm going to give you my quick suggested thing of what you need to read, and then you can stop the podcast and come back later. I mean, you ideally you want to read all 18 parts. Uh, because that's fun. But I think that you can you can um, read all of the main story, and then for the side stories, you should read the one set on Innistrad because it's really funny. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to read the one with Nahiri uh, that's on Zendikar, the one that's on Ikoria, and what mm -hmm. else is... Uh... The new Capenna one's pretty important. Yes, and the new Capenna one. Our new Capenna ones. I think there's two on new Capenna, aren't there? We'll get to that. The, yeah. Anything that's labeled no. New Capenna. But there's a New Capenna side, stands, standalone side story that you have to read and sort of read them in order of release, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let's see. Is there anything um, else? The, the Ravnica one, I think, is... Oh, yeah, the Ravnica one. Read that because it's good and it's, like, personally relevant to me. Uh, read the Ravnica one. I really like that one. And probably... Um, Arcavios is fine. Quintorius might have a spark. You can skip that one. Yeah. Like, uh, Arcavius turns out okay. That's the Strixhaven plane. Yes, yeah, so it turns out absolutely everyone. So everything is fine. Well, I don't know about that. I don't, uh, I don't think everything is fine. Uh, but we'll, we'll discuss that. But that's your kind of TLDR for if you want to read this story, but you haven't yet read the story and you're overwhelmed with how much reading there is. So with that out of the way, I think I've, we've given everyone really ample uh, warning now that we are going to be discussing the story in depth and that there's lots and lots and lots of spoilers ahead. Mm -hmm. So just so we're all clear at that point. So like I said, 10 episodes of story. Uh, episode one. We uh, have what I have seen, we just, we open on what I've seen described online glibly as uh, Elish Norn's upper management meeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a heads up. There's currently a bit of construction going on in our building, uh, and we will try to edit around it and take second cuts to cut out most of the noise. But if this podcast does seem to jump around a little bit, it's because somebody was drilling through brick. <laughs> and... You know, we we had to cut the 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 shot. Um, back to our regularly back to our regularly scheduled podcast. Yeah, th this gives a bit of insight, I think, into the uh, you know the the high level planning of the Phyrexian invasion and what they kind of want it to look like, mm. or who will be going where and doing what to what end. Mm -hmm. um, I especially liked uh, Elish Norn's uh, evaluation of oh. What's his ass? Luca. Luca. Where, you know, she sends Luca on an, on an adventure and people tell her, you know, can you really trust this guy? And she's like, oh, what do I care? Yeah. Right? If, like, it, he's, he's either going to succeed, and which case that's fine, or he's going to fail, in which case you get to go and kill him. Yeah, yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, if he fails all his, uh, he can be, if, if, even if he succeeds, uh, he can be appropriately punished for his failures is kind yeah. of how uh, it's worded. So, like, even, yeah. 
basically she's like, how are you going to conquer Ikoria, Luca? And he's like, I'm going to use, I'm going to use animals, mom. And she's like, "Uh uh-huh. And? And? Yeah. Right? Yeah. He he really feels like the kid who's been called up to give a book report. Yes. And is not, has not done his homework and is used to coasting. Yes, exactly. Uh, So it's all told from Elish Nord's point of view. And literally, like, uh, Luca, that's his name, isn't it? Uh, is literally, that's how she describes him. Yeah. She has to remember his name. Um, but she loves Nissa. Nissa is her new favorite. She, all of her other Phyrexian children are, you know, sent off to do what mom wants. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do that. And then El, uh, Elish Norn somewhat rudely, absolutely just behead Sheldred in the, the, at the beginning of the story with like no fanfare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it feels like my, Complaint about these stories or my criticism of them is that it really feels like the author was given 20 story points, which probably came in the form of cards that had to be covered in each one. Mm. Right. Um, And it honestly reflects that a lot. Yes. It's it's a lot of like A to B to C to D. And uh, it feels like it was a bit inflexible and a lot that had to get covered. Yes, this is definitely, I mean, it's like, this is a feature novels worth of storyline happening. Yeah. In a novella. Exactly. But I do feel that the, be- the I feel like this is an improvement over last time. Yes. This is yeah. so like, uh, you know, credit where credits do Watsy for saying, well, how about five pieces of story? You get 10. And I think, combined with the side stories the side stories do a really nice job most of them of like building up the flavor and like i would Mm -hmm. like to see more than more like that yeah i I think the side stories are are in general a lot better here not really because of any quality of the author or the writing but just because they feel much more at home in the realm of short fiction Mm -hmm. than the uh um uh serialized story of the set yeah I I think what I do like is that I think the author of the main story does try hard to you know like there 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 is an econo- there's an economy to the scene setting which I appreciate yeah it's like there's no messing around yeah and there are there are points where they get to you know add a little flourish or breathe a bit and mm-hmm. those are quite effective mm-hmm. yeah um all right so anyhow everybody everybody gets sent off a Johnny goes to Theros um. Let's see, who goes to, uh, Tamiyo goes to Kamigawa, but hesitates a little bit as she's sent off there. Um, Luca is rudely dispatched to Ikoria, where he's like, she's like, all right, I'm going to bring it to heal. And she's like, yeah, how, right? Yeah. yeah, (laughs) To bring, you'll bring it to heal is a given. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's, there's kind of like a principle in a lot of management circles where you, you know, with, with your underlings, you can tell them. I need a coffee. Yeah. And you don't have to explain to them. Where to go. Yeah. What's in and it. that you will need to exchange currency for a coffee and that a coffee is a liquid that comes in a cup that you will need to hold in your hand. And then you need to get back on the elevator and come up to my office and hand it to me. Right. Like, you know, that's not something that you need to explain unless you're talking to Luca. Right. Yeah. Or it's not something that you should need to verify, but. You know, for all of her management uh, failure here, and what I thought was kind of interesting in this first chapter was that Elish Norn is quite clearly not used to giving orders. Yeah, she's used to just thinking and having things... Yeah, having things happen. Yeah. Right? Um, And this whole business of, like, explicitly having to coordinate with people is just such an enormous pain for her. Yeah, exactly. Like, what an ordeal. Um, You know, poor Elish Norn. Yeah, which is why I think she sends a track to to New Capenna, because Mm -hmm. this track's a... Just listens to her. Attracts yeah, Attracts it gets it. Attracts it is like doesn't have too many thoughts of her own, mm-hmm. uh, which is a real problem for her. Mm-hmm. She doesn't like that. Yeah. Uh, like, and what I think is interesting is just Jace just goes, mm-hmm. and I think that she assumes that mm-hmm. it's because he can communicate telepathically, yes. so she doesn't have to talk to him. Yeah. He just knows what she wants. Yeah, Jason attracts her know that she's going to want coffee in about 15 minutes. Yes, exactly. Or at least that's what she thinks. Yes, but I love that Jace just leaves. Uh, spoilers, Jace is basically Sir not appearing in this story. Yeah. Which I think is really interesting. Uh, anyhow, so that's what happens. 
Uh, Elish Norn is sort of unhappy with some people and happier with uh, others. Uh, episode two, we check back in. It's uh, Chandra and Liliana and who else is waiting there? Ren is waiting there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tyvar. Tyvar. No, Ty- Tyvar, Tyvar arrives. Tyvar, Taya, and um, uh, uh, Elspeth. Y- Not Elspeth. Um, no, if who's waiting for the strike team to get back? It's Chandra, Ren, and Liliana. Yes, yes. So Chandra, Ren, and Liliana are holed up on Dominaria, uh, waiting for the strike team to get back. Uh, and it turns, and Chandra is very upset. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ren is also stressed out, and Liliana is being Liliana. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but then they finally, who comes back? Tyvar. Mm-hmm. And Tyvar, despite being Tyvar, which I will, I just, I think Tyvar, you could describe him as a Giga Chad, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ty- local tame D- Giga Chad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, overall, he's a nice guy, but like, if there could be, like, I like Tyvar. He's a likable, good person, but like, if there, if like, if you, if you don't know what the term Giga Chad is, after you read the story, you'll understand. Mm-hmm. He's just like, super confident and super brash and super wants to make himself look good but also like can do that yeah right? he's, like, he's he completely has... unthreatened by things yeah yeah he's coasted through life because he's huge and nigh impermeable yeah impermeable and he's yeah. using that power for good yeah uh it Tyvar has never met a, a problem he couldn't solve with brute force, which is something that he has in abundance. Yeah. And he has kind of an ease and a casual grace around that. And he's been raised right. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. And right. he's got like a lot of natural charisma. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, you know, your, you know, he's like a, a, a barbarian with a sense of humor, I guess. Mm. Like, you know, or like if you're thinking a D&D character. Yeah. Right? Does that, yeah. Anyhow, we, yeah, that's, yeah. that's Tyvar, Giga Chad and good guy. But he comes back and he's not his usual Tyvar self. He's just like, oh, huh, they outplanned us. They had an answer for everything, uh, is what he says. And he's all like, you know, panting and stressed out and stuff like that. And then, you know, everybody's really upset. And then who else comes back? Oh, yes, Kaya comes back. And Kaya I love because she's like organized and yeah, clever, practical. Yeah. Yeah, she's the kind of person who responds to calamity with planning. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, and so seeing her, like, being quiet, mostly, and just being like, everyone shut up, I need to think, right? Yeah. And it, it, it also speaks volumes, I think, is that... Um, yeah, your most organized person who's got, like, plans and backup plans and other backup plans is like, nope, I got nothing right now. Yeah. <laughs> And then Kaito comes back and uh, uh, is just like, everything is really bad. Uh, And then Vivian finally shows up and they sort of explain uh, that, you know, Nahiri, uh, Nissa, Jace, who else Uh, goes down? Vraska. Vraska, Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so the completed planeswalkers are... Elspeth is gone somewhere. Yeah, Elspeth is presumed dead because she blew up holding a Silex. Yeah. Right, she planeswalked while there was a detonating Silex. But yeah, Vraska, Jace, Nyssa, Luca, and Nahiri have all been completed. Mm -hmm. And so these three, which are not... Like, if you're going to pick three planeswalkers that you think are going to come back, you're like, I don't know, probably Jace... Nahiri and Kaya would be, I would say, the most powerful and competent. And to have Kaya, Kaito, and Tyvar come back as the only people yeah. left alive, that's like, oh no, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, Kaido? You made it back, huh? I, yeah. Huh. Tyvar? <laughs> yeah. I thought you just punched something in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? How are you? What happened? I'm like, oh yeah, I flexed it out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kaya, I don't think anyone's surprised that she came back. She can turn herself incorporeal. Very OP. Uh, But uh, so they're like, it's really bad. And Liliana's like, well, Mm -hmm. fuck off. I'm I'm going back to Strixhaven. I'm going to go defend Strixhaven if war is coming. Yeah, I actually thought it was was interesting to see like a little crack in Liliana's facade. Yeah, when Jace doesn't come back. Yeah, and she just refuses to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because she's usually very like, She's much more human than she lets on Mm -hmm. um, because she's always very like calm and collected and everything is according to her plan. And she doesn't care about anyone because other people are weaknesses Yes, that you can't control. 
And uh, so caring about other people means that you are vulnerable. Yes. And uh, therefore, she simply does not do that, forehead. Yeah. But Liliana does care about Strixhaven. Yeah. Which, which we find out later, which I think is really nice. Mm-hmm. She you know, is starting to feel like, you know, I think the whole Gideon thing has really like, you know, taught her that maybe it's okay to care about people and mm-hmm. or care about things. And maybe she cares about pe- people less than she cares about Strixhaven, which is a school, and Arcavios, which is a plane. I think she's sort of like warming up to caring through like caring for larger things rather than yeah. just being all about herself. Well, she's gone through the millennial transformation of being like, I don't know how old I am. And suddenly I'm introduced to a group of much younger people who need my guidance. Mm, yes. Uh, and support. And you're like, oh, no, I have nothing figured out. And then you realize, well, you've made it this far. Um, yeah. So clearly you do. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it's time to step into some kind of leadership role. I, and that's what she's doing. Yeah. I think I think black is uh, black, uh, like as a as uh, like for its good side is organized Mm -hmm. and uh sees when you know things need to be taken under control yeah for the good of things i mean like i I think it's also interesting that sorry this is not a liliana podcast yeah that's true but like i I did like that her two star pupils are a blue planeswalker and a red planeswalker Mm -hmm. neither of whom have a lot of black because she's like uh as I say, not as I do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, black can be, I think, a mentorship color. Like, I'm not all viziers are evil, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Like, more like, you know, the Discworld patrician. Mm-hmm. Definitely a black line character, but te- I, I think he has the best the best for Ankh more pork in mind. I just reread mm. the first episode, of, <laughs> the first Discworld book, so it's top of mind. Mm. But anyhow, so anyhow, but uh, so Liliana, you know, has a thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the Arcavio side story. Uh, and then Ren and Chandra are like, no, you're right. We have to. Chandra spends this whole time being like, we have to go. We have to go beat them up. We have to go get them. They need our help. And and everybody else is like, no, you're bananas. But Ren, who's been outside, is like, no, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. I think this is unjust. And I think that we need to fix things. And right. I have an idea. Right. Kind of. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you, you, I... I I sympathize with everyone else who was like this much larger and more prepared and organized strike force that had a clear idea of what they were trying to do mm-hmm. uh, failed and not only failed, like failed catastrophically. Um, and you're going to go and solo it because oh. you're really angry and not thinking clearly. Yeah, because your friend didn't come back. Your friend, mm-hmm. quotation mark. They uh, were very, they were roommate. Your, yeah. Your roommate didn't come back. We'll get to that at the end we'll, uh, mm-hmm. later too. But so that's what happens. Uh, episode three, which is set on Kamigawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Kamigawa is a really sad story, but kind of, sort of, has an okay ending. So basically, yeah. we see Kamigawa absolutely get ruined. They describe Boseju as, like, ripped in half and, like, seeping oil. Mm-hmm. So that seems really bad for Kamigawa. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed the symmetry of the various trees around the plains experiencing World Breaker, or Realm Breaker. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a tree isn't a single... A tree isn't a class of organisms, it's a strategy. Mm-hmm. I had thoughts around this. We we don't need to get into them here. I could write a paper. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, Tamio breaks open Boseju, turns it into a fountain of oil. Yeah, basically. Um, and the emperor leads a counterattack, and they have uh, a Kurosawa battle. Essentially. Yeah. But it turns out Tamio, because she had like this little falter but, mm. of like to where she didn't say anything to Elish Norn when she gets sent to Kamigawa. And then she opens a scroll, mm-hmm. which you'd never see what's described. It's sort of like, to me in her head, she's kind of like flicking the lid off, but it's like a, a, a yeah. ring that keeps it closed. Well, it's very biblical. Yes. Right? Op- opening the scrolls that end the world. Yeah. Or she op- telling the stories that end the world. But she has a different scroll, right? Yes. This yeah, other s- yeah. one that's a talked about but they don't tell you what's in it Mm -hmm. and she opens that and then the emperor and kaito show up and then you know her son nashi is there Mm -hmm. uh which is really sad he's the rat that got adopted uh by her and he's like mom and she's just like 
but it turns out she's sort of like holding her punches and hesitating a little bit and uh uh tamio is uh uh dispensed by the emperor i would say actually in fairly short notice yeah it's like tamio's not a frontline combatant <laughs> yeah and <laughs> right? doesn't really her heart doesn't seem to be in it you know yeah. what i mean uh and she passes away she dies uh but uh upon her death the scroll that she opened up sort of happens and this like ghost memory of her that's not like her but not it's, like a full ghost kind yeah, of it's thing composed of all of her writing basically yeah. right which is which is an interesting idea yeah um that her uh a creature is contained in this spirit because you know it's the important part of her um and it says something that i thought was un or that made me pause which was that it was a spell that she had uh created that in the event of her death this spirit composed of all of her writing and all of her memories would be created and she said the the spirit says like i had hoped this day would never come and i'm like wait so planeswalkers are immortal then or ageless deathless like what isn't I think I, I'm, I'm actually unfamiliar with the lore around planeswalkers aging I, and getting old and dying well i think old walkers were mm. like ageless yeah because like nahiri is like thousands of years old but i never got the impression that new walkers were particularly ageless or um immortal because we've seen planeswalkers but we saw lots of planeswalkers sort of eat it off screen in war of the spark implied to have been killed and we saw domri ray just getting ruined yeah right yeah oh oh yeah they, they can definitely die um they can be killed but like do they just not li live are they somebody will have 40 people are currently typing in the comments to inform yes. me about where i can read about this but that was just like a oh, oh okay i guess i guess Ta tamio assumed she wouldn't die yes i i mean i don't know if it, i think i think assumes is a stress because it's like i hope this day would never come i think it's like it's, it's like i hoped i would never have to be created it might be an untimely death spell yeah 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 it might be like the insurance policy god i hope to never cash my insurance policy hmm. i don't know i feel that i feel that i don't know what the normal lifespan of planeswalkers i guess is what we're saying here mm -hmm. but yeah uh, so that's what happens in episode three, and it's very sad. And people are very sad about that. But also probably good that Tamio is no longer a Phyrexian now, because I don't think she liked it that much uh, secretly on the inside. Mm -hmm. We get some more insight into how some people are not as Phyrexian as other people, even yes. though they've been completed. Uh, but f now we go to episode four. And which is kind of a check in on a lot of planes. Mm -hmm. uh, so first up, we check in on Kama on uh, Kaltheim, which is not doing well. Yeah. Uh, um, you, there's some. They spoiled some art, and it looks like Toski has been completed. <laughs> yeah, which seems bad. Um, like yeah, the 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 invasion of Kamigawa seems like very short and extremely violent. Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 one on um, Kaltheim. Uh, Kaltheim is. You know, this is going to be a much more drawn out conflict. Yeah, this is like a full on siege because these people are, these people fight each other for fun. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see some fun moments of like everybody on Kaldheim, like, you know, King Harald talks about how you would never see these people, but they're all fighting together. Yeah, you know? don't, but don't worry. Once this is done, we'll go back to killing each other. Yeah, exactly. Which I thought was, you know, that. Yeah, that amuses me. Yeah, uh, but they're ready to go, but it's not looking good. There's like a doom scar just going off, and they're not mm -hmm. even worried about that at that yeah. point. They're like, oh, good, a doom scar. That's good, because some of them will fall into that, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. holy God. Uh, um, and then Coma comes up, and Coma's been completed. Yep. Uh, so Tyvar uh 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 basically does what Tyvar does, and he dives into Coma's mouth to... <laughs> kill it from the inside i guess yeah and and it's like all right and it's like with this with a seething song of battle at his back and a cry from his chest tyvar leaps from the ship however the story of this day ends the sagas will tell he was no coward and mm -hmm. i think that's great i think that you really get tyvar's inner monologue there yeah yeah i forget the name of the the spirit in norse mythology that when it wakes up it's supposed to you know and the world part part of ragnarok yeah but this seems like a uh, a fate like 
everyone on Kaldheim seems to take this as like, no, this isn't real Ragnarok. This is fake. Yeah, and- Ragnarok's not supposed to have all these Phyrexian symbols on it. That's you. Sorry, this is you've corrupted it literally. Yeah, this, this is off brand. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I. I I just really enjoyed the speech that said, you know, this this will not be the end of our way of life. We will go back to fighting one another. Yes, exactly. I promise you. <laughs> Kaldheim seems like a fun place, honestly. <laughs> I mean, briefly. <laughs> Whatever's left of it seems like it'll be great to visit. Yeah. Um, then we go to Kaladesh and we check in with Kaladesh and we see that Pia, well, this is from Pia Nalar's point of view, mm-hmm. that's Chandra's mom. Uh, things are not super going well on Kaladesh. Um, they have they have been preparing. Sahili has warned them ahead of time mm-hmm. that something bad is coming. But Kaladesh is uh, does not fare well, and ev- all of these uh, all of the Phyrexians basically are making for the Aetherflux Reservoir, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is like you know the big explosives tower in the center of town, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, you, you keep them away from the reactor. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, their their nuclear their nuclear magic reactor is a really good way of thinking it, of <laughs> yeah. it. Uh which uh, and considering like the the Aetherborn are just basically the come off the fumes of that was just like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, this could be a bad one. <laughs> so, things aren't going well, but Sahili has made a lot of little like or they're not little at all, but she's made a lot of mechanical dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, she has zoids. It's that's super fun, uh, but uh, it's not great mm-hmm. overall. All right now on to New Capenna, where Atraxa just spends the entire time just stomping through the museum. Yeah, being really offended at the abstract concept of concepts. Beauty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't like it. Doesn't like New Capenna at all. Doesn't like the angels. Feels everything is like disgusting. Does not. Uh, just the ambient amount of halo in the air is uh, not good for her, her skin mm-hmm. or something like that. Like she's not having a good time. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone's a critic, <laughs> right? Like she she goes into this museum and just has like experiences an entire undergrad's degree of aesthetics come crashing in on her in you know fifteen seconds or so. Um, yeah, she basically she's under strict orders from Elish Norn to basically don't bother completing anybody. Yeah, yeah. Just I, decimate all life on this plane. Yeah. Because Elish Norn hates uh hates um uh Elspeth and uh, is afraid of her above all of else. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, there uh there is uh this uh there is a thing at the very end of the story. Uh, the seraphs remain watching her go with their visitor hovering among them in a haze of color. They keep mentioning there's this mm. visitor watching yeah. what's going on. They too speak among themselves. Why not stop her, asks the visitor. It is not yet time. It does not feel like the right answer, but the visitor cannot disprove it. Have faith. It's almost here, the end. You will know what to do when we've gotten there. And it's like, who are these people? Mm-hmm. Who's going on? Yeah, who, who's this through line? Yes. I mean, I think that is, of course... Uh, that's uh, that's Elspeth, as we'll see. But who else is it? Well, we're going to go over to the side stories, and we'll recap some of the, what's happening in the side stories real fast before we get back to the main story, because it's all kind of goes in an order. Uh, Arcavios. Arcavios is getting absolutely screwed. Uh, Strixhaven is absolutely getting ruined. Most of the professors end up getting killed. The whole library gets, like, torn apart, which seems yeah. pretty bad. Yeah, and they, they uh, you know, our five main characters from... Um, from Strixhaven are going through the biblioplex looking for the spell, the founding spell. I the, forget. the invocation of the founders. Yeah. The invocation of the founders, which, you know, is basically like, I don't know, the source code for Strixhaven. Yeah. Um, that describes. They're having a Harry Potter adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> um, it's very true to its roots. Um, and, you know, Killian's father shows up to protect him from uh, completed, uh, Shahail, uh, which is yeah. the other, which is the white dean. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they make reference to the fact that Liliana has a bunch of students holed up in housing protected by undead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they are looking for this spell that describes the founding process of Strixhaven. And when they cast it, I did like that, you know, Killian comment. Is it Killian who comments that? Or is it Quintorius who comments that this is boring? Yeah. <laughs> right. This is very like, this is some low level uh, spellcrafting that is very, very 
Well, I mean, it's necessarily elementary, right? It's yeah. describing the position of the of the stones and every like. It, it is fundamental. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's from Quintorius's point of view. Shock ran through Quint. The words were so, and then in italics, prosaic. The mm. invocation simply describes Strixhaven. Here, the invocation stated the ground had this consistency. It sloped in this manner and contained these types of stones. But as they are all reading the invocation of the founders, which needs to be read from, you know, these color perspectives and stuff like that you know basically it's like a self-defense spell i mm -hmm. guess that kind of helps fend off the phyrexians but just as they're just about to finish of course they are attacked by dean nasari who's ruth is dean uh and rutha stops reading her part of the spell uh mm -hmm. because she's you know gets distracted because that's rutha she has adhd uh, <laughs> i mean kind of that's very glib, but she but she's defending them because he's trying to kill them. And Quint tries to read his part of the spell, but like put magic into her. He doesn't know what he's doing either. Mm -hmm. And but it works. And it, but it's so it takes so much out of him, and it's so traumatic. He is engulfed in a flash of white light and whisks away. Yeah, I like I like Quint. He's basically a very good boy, and uh, I think I think I like the idea of like a an honorable Boros Plainswalker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, we have a vacancy in that color identity. Okay, we have a few Pauline's <laughs> Walker vacancies. Uh, uh, um, and uh, yeah, so basically then the invocation of the founders kind of works. It kind of protects Strixhaven, but it's not really going to solve the... It doesn't like repel all the invaders or anything mm -hmm. like that. So at the end of that, after Liliana like finds... The other four students who are very beat up, like mm -hmm. we're talking like, I think Rutha has a broken leg, right? Like people are very injured after mm -hmm. this because the whole thing collapses, right? The, the platform they're standing on. Yeah. And they're like pulled out of the rubble, except there's no sign of Quint. And L Liliana's like, hmm, Casamina said there was an ember among these them, these ones. So I assume it's that one, but I'm too busy right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and she's like, she does this cool thing where she's like, you know, she can see that the invocation's kind of working, but not really enough, you know, and she's just like, no, I like this here. This is my space. And then she's just like, and it's like, she's like, she like pulls out her own power, which is like, like purple, but not like a glowy, happy purple. And just like reaches really far down into the earth and finds like all of the oldest bones and zombies. And she's just like, rise. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She is gonna. She is going to defend basically the entire plane mm -hmm. with just zombies. She's gonna need to lie down after this. She's not as young as she used to be. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, well, I mean, you know, stick with what you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Worked on. Worked on Innistrad. Yeah, yeah. Liliana's hands dropped to her sides. Her fingers opened. Light spilled from her palms. Not the blurky blood color thrashing overhead or even the clear br brightness that fought against it. It was her light, dim and grim. It sank like water into the ground. Far below, in the corpse-strewn ruins of the school, in the catacombs where ancient professors moldered, even beneath that were the bones of unnamed, unknown thousands leached into the bedrock. Her magic found bodies and gave them new life. Hmm. So it's just like... Hmm... So, uh, they, I think that's cool. Go, Liliana. Yeah. I will point out, here's my thought. Strixhaven is going to have kind of like a power vacuum, I think, after this, because most of the tenured faculty is dead. Yeah, the yeah. The founding so, dragons are, like, not around. Yeah, yeah. It's the, who knows where they are. Um, yeah, I, I guess promotions for everyone. Hey, everyone, we're all going to get paid. Promotions for Liliana. Yeah. When, do we come back to Strixhaven and she's just in charge of the school? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, who... <laughs> yeah, who else? Yeah, I mean, yes, Dean Ambrose inexplicably managed to survive mm -hmm. uh, by being, like, so, so rude he could <laughs> kill Phyrexians yeah. with word magic. But, I, but, like, you know, Liliana, it's just like, she... All star, A plus, mm -hmm. like um, above and beyond. No job is worth that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I enjoy this this version of magic. Like, I, I like the Silver Quill version of magic, where you are, you know, literally speaking things into being. Yeah. Um. You know, it's a very kind of you know, it, it's logos. Yeah. Right? The power of words to create. Um. And that's kind of how the 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 school, at least, is created, mm -hmm. and how it is more well. Somewhat saved. Yeah. Right? The, there is no space for phyrexia between the words. 
I like that. Next story. Got it. We got it. We're on a. Yeah, we got to clip along. We got to clip along here. The next story. We don't. We're not going to have that as much to say about each of these side stories. The next story. We go to Ikoria, where things are not going well on Ikoria, mm-hmm. but. Rele- there's a few relevant things. One, Dranith is completely sacked. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's like the survivors are being led away by uh, Kudro, uh, but the the little younger lady Kudro, um, uh, who is now in charge. That's Luca's ex fiance. Um, and they see you see uh, a scene where the oil uh, bubbles on Ikorian crystals, which mm-hmm. then glow, and then the crystal, and then the oil just turns to steam and dissipates. Mm. So this is the first time you see that every plane is different. And uh, I've seen this theory thrown around a lot, a lot and I quite like it. Mm-hmm. Planes where things are more metallic are much more susceptible to oil. Yeah. And, th- and planes without a lot of metal and aren't really into that are not as susceptible, as you can see, because the oil is literally like rendered inert just by the weird magical aura of Ikoria. And why? I don't know, because mana works different on Ikoria than it does on Phyrexia. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, you know, this was not... Th- this is step two of a three-step invasion plan. That yeah. is all question marks. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Put oil on it. And it's like, well, it turns out oil doesn't really work that way on Ikoria. But I mean, there's still horrible monsters everywhere and the city's yeah. been ruined. So that's like, it's not going well. And it turns out Luca is chasing down the refugees of Dranith because he's on a personal vendetta mission instead of like... Doing what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah. Anyhow. So... <laughs> yeah, he has a bad time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he gets lured into the nest of a huge... of Zapandril. I think so. The huge beast. Uh, let's see. What is it? Vadrock. He's a, yes, he gets lured into Vadrock's nest. Vadrock is a huge beastie from the first uh, mm. Ikoria. It's like bat wing dragon thing. Um, and uh, Vadrock basically bites him in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, shucks off all the Phyrexian things that, yeah, he, uh, his, his ex fiance leads him into Vadrock's nest. Um, and, uh, Vadrock sort of bites Luca out from his, like, Phyrexian extra body. He's sort of grafted around himself from things he's assimilated, essentially. He's wandering around like this huge, overgrown male insect. Uh, and then, uh, like, Vivian shoots him with the arc bow. He gets chewed up and spit out. And then Vadrock breathes, like, blue flame on him that just turns him into ash Mm -hmm. he's absolutely he's at his he's so obliterated like his memory is gone basically is how they put it yeah this seems personal quite i don't think the i don't think the writers like luca very much but i also think it's important that not every person you you meet is a good person yeah some people are yeah yeah i mean (laughs) In fiction, we are quite often encouraged to uh, see things from the villain's perspective, which is interesting in fiction. But some people are just stupid and bad (laughs) also. Mm -hmm. And that's important to remember, too. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes it's not that complicated. Yeah, very true. (laughs) Well, that that not that complicated guy meets his end rather (laughs) abruptly. Yes. All right. Back to the main story. All right, Chandra and Ren decide, you know what, Go. we're going to New Phyrexia. Well, you know what, they haven't tried fire, and yeah. I'm good at fire, and and uh, or I guess from Ren's point of view, you're good at fire, and I have a fire inside me, mm-hmm. which is all like, Ren's big thing is because she's red, green aligned. Uh, and so they get to New Phyrexia, and they meet with the Resistance, and they meet their new friend. Uh, it's Urbrask. Yep. This is from Chandra's point of view. Staring at her own reflection in Urbrask's polished carapace, she's not sure what to think. He hasn't attacked yet, but maybe he's waiting for the right time. He hasn't insulted her, gone on about unity, but maybe it's all a cover. <sighs> Anyhow, Urbrask does not like this. Uh, the the whole, like, bend the universe to our will mm-hmm. being in strong air quotes about Phyrexia. Yeah. Uh, red is the color of freedom. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, Urbrask is the is you know powered by the red mirror and the sun, mm-hmm. and he is like doesn't like being told what to do. Yeah, yeah, he you know it's it's uh, d- d- uh, uh the devil's advocate, right? The office yeah. in the in the papacy that challenges um uh the divinity of saints by trying to disprove them. Yes, right. Um, 
you know, it's an important thing to have, a skeptic, uh, a cynic. Yeah. I came here to help Chandra Snaps. I don't care what some Phyrexian weirdo thinks of me. I'm going to do what I can here. Why are you even helping us anyway? Fire roars from the eye holes of Urbrask's carapace because Norn stifles the fires of creation with her pontificating. Phyrexia cannot thrive if there is only one Phyrexia. Magna drips from his jaws, plumes of smoke rising from the holes they burn. Even Anut understands. Urbrask serves no one. Mm -hmm. No yeah. notes. Uh, I like Urbrask. Yeah. Everyone does. He's everyone's favorite praetor, I think. Yeah, yeah. He just uh -huh. wants to be left alone to do his work. Uh, so yeah, so basically they come up with a plan. They're going to try to get uh, Ren and Chandra to the world tree with Koth and Malaria and stuff. And uh, things don't go well at all. They see Nyssa. Uh, mm -hmm. Nyssa is very loyal to Phyrexia. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, I, I thought it was interesting which planeswalkers kind of fall hard. And it's the ones who are the personalities that form the strongest bonds the easiest. Mm -hmm. Right? Like a Johnny? Gone. Yep. Um, Nyssa, you know, uh, uh, she cares for people kind mm -hmm. of in her own way. She has very strong connections to things. Also gone. Uh, Tamiya, who wanders around collecting stories, maybe less so, even though she's kind of like got a lot of family and got along quite a long quite well with the Johnny. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there isn't as much consistency here as I want there to be, or as I'm imagining there to be. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think, it, I think the problem is that they're not fully, com I think that the problem with planeswalkers completing them is to fully complete them would remove their spark. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have various amounts of fully completion. And I think your more individualistic ones are just a little less like likely to go along with it. I think you've nailed it, right? Yeah. So yeah. it is inconsistent because it's almost, ba it's like, personally, how do they feel about it? Jace isn't a joiner, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Frasca's not like a joiner, right? Well, well I mean, kind she, of. She's always been in leadership positions wherever she's gone. Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, Jace has been forced into leadership positions, although he was famously truant about them yeah doesn't um, like doing it yeah uh so you know that there, there is complete completion and then there is incompletion yeah there... right jace's incompletion theorem mm -hmm. uh you can't get there all the way so yeah exactly they spend a long time so basically they try to the, their ren's plan is to be, is to bond with the tree mm -hmm. so they try to get ren and Malaria and Koth and and Chandra to the tree, and yeah. Urbrask helps them. But just as they're about to go, Ren is like right at the tree. Nissa is there, mm -hmm. and Nissa and have Chandra have a long talk. And Chandra's like, "I can't, I can't go with you, even as tempting as it is. Uh, it's not great." Mm -hmm. uh, so then, back more main story. Uh, let's see. Let's see who, oh yes, this is, this is, I'm going to title this chapter, I was right, ha 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 ha, I was right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the chapter where Elspeth is having a long talk, uh, and it turns out with whatever disembodied sort of spirit of Sarah lives in the place beyond the multiverse. Right, yeah. Basically gets a pep talk, and a pat on the shoulder, and uh, a kind of a tour of what's going on in the multiverse. So first she gets to see uh, uh, New Capenna, mm -hmm. and she's like, ah, honestly, they seem like they've got it under control. Um, then we see Theros, where Ajani is doing a lot of bad stuff to the gods. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did like the Theros um, interlude, where because belief is what creates divinity on Theros... The sudden instantaneous appearance of an entire polity of Phyrexians who are all about like orthodox or, or, orthodoxy and belief just instantly corrupts a large chunk of the gods. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we currently outnumber uh, 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 Heliod's normal uh, branch of belief. Yeah. So we get to define what Heliod is now. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Theros is not doing well, but we don't stop there. We basically, we get this whirlwind tour of how effed the universe is, essentially. Uh, she gets to see a castle, now shining, reduced to rumble. I believe that's Eldraine, 
probably. Or bent. Or maybe. A young yeah. man is rifles through the broken remains of an armory. The plate covering him is cobbled together and already okay. pitted with black. Yeah, the, he, he finds a sigil. It's, yes. It's bent. Oh, okay. Yeah. He finds a sigil. She's good. Uh, but she's like, all right, that's fine. Through ranks of horsemen beating war drums, their hounds on the hunt for Phyrexian enemies. Through a neon city protected by towering mechanical guardians. Through strange swamps and twisted hills. She goes through all these different places. Uh, and then she finally ends up at New Phyrexia. Uh, and then we get to see a little bit of what's going on from New Phyrexia. So, now, it is heavily implied that Urbrask is being killed here. Yeah. So, because they, because his his dying screams. Yeah, he he's he's um drawn and quartered. Horrible. Yeah. Poor Urbrask. Finally got him. So that's that is the dissenting factions of mana now mm. killed. Uh, so now it's just Urbrask, Vornclex, and Jingitaxis. Um, and uh, there's and then. Then or, basic- sorry, Elish Norn. Or, yeah, El- Elish yeah. Norn. Yes, yeah, sorry. And then you see Centurions bring three more prisoners before Elish Norn. This part's kind of important because this is Elspeth watching all of this. And, and you know, and you see that they have, uh, they have uh, Koth, uh, Ren, who they've torn from her tree, mm-hmm. which is horrific. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Chandra Nalar, all of whom are extremely beat up. And Nyssa is, uh, is you know there and is like behold i have caught your traitors and karn who they describe earlier as being or maybe later as being able to feel pain who's just like you know like a pile of bits that have all been pulled apart is like no uh and then basically elspeth is like oh this is where i need to go i need to go to new phyrexia i i need to i need to do what i need she goes uh as much as she doesn't want to read them, the answers are plain across her heart. If she saves a Johnny, she will be only saving a single person. Alone, he isn't enough to turn the tide. New Capenna can save itself, which re- which leaves Ren and Nyssa, the, th- the glowing thread tying them together. Yes, yeah, she understands. The decision isn't whether to save Nyssa or save Ren. It's to keep Nyssa occupied for long enough for Ren to reach the tree. You're certain, the woman asks. Elspeth nods. Uh, her body feels strange, as if every nerve is alight at once. It's the right thing to do. All right. And then they do this thing where she's like, I'm afraid, which is what Elspeth always says. And it's like, you'll be fine, kid. Tap, tap, tap. Or actually, uh, the woman embraces her. Fear is always the last thing to leave. Uh, you've slain it time and time again. Do not falter now, Elspeth. It is the last thing she hears before Sarah fades away. I've stood up and went like that when I read that. Mm. Anyhow, so Elspeth decides to do that. She uh, is literally, they say she is reborn. She is reborn as an angel, as an angel, and, and does a thing, and then you just see Jin Gataxis raises his claws, but Elspeth's sword is there to meet them. <sighs> mm. Amazing, fun, cool, exciting. So that's kind of cool. Elspeth is back as an angel. Uh, and then we see Part seven, which is Elspeth going and fighting everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it's an action se- sequence. Yeah, Malaria gets seriously wounded. In yeah, this. she gets gut shot and just keeps going. Yeah, she's just like, well, we'll worry about that later. Uh, Malaria is nothing if not extremely tough. Um, and Elspeth realizes who, or uh, Elish Norn realizes who has shown up, mm. which is Elspeth. And Elish Norn, I would say, freaks the f out yeah yeah uh so uh, uh elspeth shows up heals koth and and chandra and uh d- d- per- patches up ren a bit she's not doing great without a tree honestly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and uh and norn is just like has a thing uh she just literally starts throwing random stuff at her and i'm tra- yes but nor basically she's has she's having a meltdown so bad that she's that she just starts flinging stuff at Elspeth, chunks of her throne, a horn she snaps from a howling Vornclex, mm-hmm. <laughs> the severed head of an unlucky choir member. She just starts, ra- just like me, flailing. I yeah. think it's really funny the mental image of her being like ah ah ah, grabbing Vornclex's <laughs> horn and snapping it off, and he's like ah ah, like yeah, yeah. no, it's. It's, honestly, it's satisfying. It's extremely undignified. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then Karn is like, oh, I'm not giving up yet. And then Ren bonds with the tree, essentially. Uh, well, Ren, Ren gets to the tree. Mm-hmm. They get they get Ren to the tree. It's very difficult, but they do it. Uh, and Elspeth kind of uh, has a fight with Norn, and she doesn't actually kill Norn. She wounds her. They have a long talk. This is like what you know, like I have the high ground kind yeah. of that talk. Yeah. Uh, except Elspeth leaves at the end of the battle because she needs to go help other people, and mm-hmm. Elish Norn. She's not even that worried about it. I guess. I don't know. Uh, she needs to help Chandra and Ren and stuff like that. Um, so what happens is basically Elish is like, blah, blah, we hate you. And mm-hmm. Elspeth's like, what do you, what's this we stuff? You hate me. Mm-hmm. This is all, you're, you're, you're a megalomaniac. This isn't the glory of Phyrexia. It's your glory. Yeah, well, I mean, the, there's no, it's interesting in that the Phyrexians, the Neo-Phyrexians, don't have a core to their belief, right? They believe in a thing that's called phyrexia, but there's never a good definition of what that is. It's just you all have to be united in your belief of it. Yeah. Um, you know, the 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 phi, the phi symbol of phyrexia, I always thought would be more interesting if it was open in the middle mm. because there's just like this empty core to it. Right. Right. There's no yogmoth that they venerate. They yes. Don't know that word. Yeah, but Norn wants to be that Yogmoth. Yeah. She wants to be the person in charge, and in fact, so bad that that basically, while Koth and Malyria and Chandra and Nissa and or Chandra and Ren are all getting away, mm-hmm. right, and Nissa's chasing after them, Elspeth is just ignoring that, and she's trying to kill, or Elish Norn is ignoring that and trying to kill Elspeth so much so that Jun Kataxis is like, eh, "Excuse me, ma'am." Mm-hmm. Um. Shouldn't we be worried about those people over there? And she's just like, shut the F up. I have more important things to deal with. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Quiet uh, fool, I'm trying to think. Yes, exactly. And then there's, so while well, Norn and Elspeth are having their fight, Elspeth is like, you disagreed with Jin Gataxius, didn't you? Phyrexia wants you to ignore me, but you want differently. <laughs> right? And uh, so she, uh, yeah. So she's kind of beats up they have a fight for a bit, and then she, Elspeth, is like, actually, no, I've been dawdling too long. I have to go protect Ren and Chandra. Mm-hmm. So that is what is going on over there. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the Phyrexian uh, mini-body problem is kind of interesting, right? Like, five suns, it's not a stable configuration. That's know. true. Something will always be ejected and or collide. Ah. Sorry, I'm skimming this story. I don't remember what happens in the Ixalan story very well. Um, uh, me neither. No, um, I think we can summarize a bunch of the other side stories as really interesting and fun to read, but not necessarily important to the plot. Yeah. So Ixalan, what's Watley doing? What are some dinosaurs doing? <laughs> yes. d- fighting Phyrexians. Uh, Innistrad, what's going on? Well, uh, Sword is there. Defend. Uh, he's, you see him referenced. Uh, as a, uh, a a long-haired guy with bad manners who's mm. talking to Ludovic. Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, who shows up and, and, and Geralt is like, who's this guy? Who's this asshole? Yeah, uh, but this is, I, I don't know, this is the most fun one, oh God, easily. This, this story is so fun. If these characters are really entertaining. I like them a lot. Go and read it. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, it turns out that whatever weird magic that makes Innistrad zombies go... Mm-hmm. doesn't work with phyresis yeah so like they can't even use their it's their it's like opposite ends of a magnetic it's like two north magnetic yeah, poles, poles almost or something like that like when Gisa is trying to reanimate phyrexians as zombies they don't that they just fall apart yeah it just it doesn't work yeah it, it, and she like actually has the most theoretical insight into how phoresis works or how the uh, the oil works of any of the characters which i thought was interesting mm-hmm. like she starts to formulate like a hypothesis around what is going on here although mm-hmm. she wouldn't use those terms no right but those are her brother's stupid terms yeah and i i don't know i this one was a lot of fun go and read it yeah. um yeah i don't it, even want to like spend a lot of time talking about it because oh. it's just it's really entertaining. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it basically, Innistrad is essentially saved through Necro Warfare TM. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the, through the mutual distaste of an estranged brother and sister who still write to each other all the time. Yes. 
I, I, I love the Sasanis as characters. They're great. Please mm-hmm. go read this. Aldrain. Also, which is not necessarily important for you to read at all, mm-hmm. but also but, pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rankle and Torbjorn's bogus journey. Yeah. yeah Torbran. Yeah. Turns well, Rankle, you know, Rankle and Torbran are uh <laughs> not friends, which I think is yes. very appropriate because Rankle's an asshole. Yeah, yeah. He's described as being so rude, not even the other fairies like him. Yeah. But they somewhat team up, and uh, and I don't know. Um, Eldraine seems to sort of like deal a huge blow against the Phyrexians by uh, you know sheer luck and accident, which is kind of I think appropriate for a yeah a the fairy tale plane yeah, yeah. fairy tale plane. Uh, so yeah, they're doing okay. They seem to weirdly take it in stride, right? Well, that that weird stuff is. True. Well, I was going to say they do, do mention that the entire court system has been has has fallen and all, and the Kenris are dead. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's and it. that's just very casually mentioned that things are things going to absolute hell. Yeah. I I, I think I just appreciated Rankle's perspective on this. Yeah. As being like, well, this is kind of interesting. Yes. What does this mean for Rankle, though? Yeah, the story's told from Rankle's point of view, yeah. so you're not getting a whole lot of information about what's happening on the planet. Yeah, it's very unsentimental. I kind of like that, though, because yeah. we are going into Wilds of Eldraine. Mm-hmm. Maybe because the other parts are all destroyed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, a festering pit. Uh, and then we get to see Ravnica. Now, this is some, This is a story you should read. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, because it's really well written. Uh, two, it's kind of sexy in one part. Yeah, no, it's 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 honestly kind of hot. And uh, Ravnica is my favorite plane. Uh, so how is Ravnica doing in the invasion? Real bad. There's mention that, like, you know, these uh, world, bre- world Breaker tentacles aren't just going into the ground. They're going, like, right into the Undercity where the Golgari are and, like, flinging, like, tearing through the ground mm-hmm. and doing some major work. They're also mentioning that they had just finished repairing the chamber of the Guild Pack after Cap- yeah. Nickel Bolas is there. Yeah, and well, it gets caved like- in again, which I think is really funny yeah well i mean like i think ravnica is always going to be kind of vulnerable to these big events because cities have a lot of people living in them and they don't really react to being damaged terribly well no right like you know it's oh the world tree just sent a a branch through a a a building and uh you know now a million people are just kind of like going to die in the next 30 seconds yeah and 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 400,000 people are homeless right yeah so not great, uh, but uh, we uh, uh, we have uh, we get some really good insight into what is going on mm-hmm. in Vraska's head because she was not really mentioned in the one story much, uh, but we see a little bit of Vraska and we see a little bit of Phyrexian Vraska, which is in a which is in bold red italic font like mm-hmm. bolded and italicized red font. So it's easy to tell what the Phyrexian part is and what the actual Vraska is. Uh, there is, she can sort of like, she's sort of watching herself go and is sort of somewhat in control of her body, but not really. And mm-hmm. is this because Vraska is partially sort of a bit more like doesn't like to be told what to do, yes. right? Because yeah. she has a whole childhood history, which we explore of like being abused by the Azorius because she is a Golgari and she mm-hmm. is a Gorgon and stuff like that. Is it like a little bit of anti-authoritarianism to her, or is it that she has a secret mind palace that she can go to because Jace made her one when they were to- when they were taking on Nicol Bolas? Who knows? Um, but you get to see some really horrible and sad and moving backstory for uh, for Vraska and like why mm-hmm. she is the way she is, and then we get yeah, to the- see Phyrexi and Vraska going through and being absolutely horrible mm-hmm. and uh, blinding people on purpose because that's what the Azorius used to do to the Gorgons. Yeah, horrifying. Um, but Vraska has a little bit of her mind left and somehow Phyrexi and Vraska seems to think that it's very important that she goes to her old apartment, which is includes all sorts of things. Uh, it has it is includes tokens and souvenirs from a dozen different planes, a banner of Lochthwain above the stove, a Theron pot I kept tea in, a Kaldheimer drinking horn, an entire Segovian chariot I could barely carry into the blind eternities, but now sits under a bell jar because mm-hmm. Segovia is the tiny plane. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. love that. Uh, and uh, she's there, and she grabs the thaumatic compass, which, as we call, mm-hmm. was was the MacGuffin that would point you to the eternal sun. 
sun mm-hmm. and it detects planeswalker activity is mm-hmm. what we've so if you're not familiar with that because that was quite a few years ago but she puts that in and she grabs it and then we have this scene where she is ends up fighting facing off against Ral Zarek, who yeah. as we recall is of the Izzet Guild and yeah. a planeswalker yeah, himself. Yeah, he's now the 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 master of the Izzet Guild. Yeah. And uh his uh his husband is Tomic. Mm-hmm. Not Tomic. What's his husband's name? No, the Tomic. Tomic. Yes, yeah. Tomic of the Azor- of the Orzov Guild, which I yeah. think is sweet. You get to see them being like good luck, hun, which I think is very cute. Yeah. But uh it, it so Vraska has a face off against him and uh it uh yeah it somehow Ral Zarek, which I think is the most this is the most Ravnican thing ever, uh the Izzet Guild have solved this whole Phyresis problem with what if we tried blowing it up? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like <laughs> Ral Zarek uses his uh I for hemoelectric yeah, reactor. So, yes. Something like that. It's like, oh weird, I just randomly had this thing that microwaves your blood um for no reason. Let me just like Bam it into you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, yeah, he, they, yeah. The he basically they figured out a way to uh to make blood and oil boil from the inside, and yeah. that turns out to be very effective at turning off Phyrexian oil. <laughs> yeah. Wow, How? your anti Phyrexian device works really well. How did you know to make this? The what? <laughs> Oh, we just we had a bag of these lying around that we confiscated from the students. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, they do these like poppers. Yeah. I love I love Ravnica. It's such a silly place. <laughs> yeah. Um. But anyhow, so Ra- Vraska gets all all big zapped, and instead of dying, she goes to this sort of like meditation plane sort mm-hmm. of area where she meets Jace of all people. Yeah. And it's actually Jace. She says, "Is this an illusion of you?" And he's like, "Nah." And she notices like a speck in his eye she's never noticed before, mm-hmm. which I think is interesting. Yeah, it's very tender and intimate. It is sweet. They basically, they make out, we'll say. Yeah. It's, definitely, we know that they make out, and it's up to you to decide whether they do anything more on the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, they would stop, I'm sure. I mean, I read yeah, I'm it. sure they're going to save themselves from marriage, my, like my... they have in the past. <laughs> my internal monologue was that they just made out. Uh, that's what I. That's where I stopped. And I was like, oh, I suppose you could read this as something else. But anyhow, um... They, uh, they're, they're kissing and stuff like that, uh, and, uh, there's some, there's, there's, so it's a very interesting thing that happens at the end of this. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's another one of the side stories with a very ambiguous ending. This is, this is the most, this Or is, the, the, the unclear ending. Yeah, basically. He says, so, they basically, they finish making out. Uh, and uh, Jace looks apologetic. Brace yourself, this part hurts. He cradles my face, puts his forehead against mine, readies himself, and exhales Exhales if he's about to exert effort. I've got you. And I smile, uncertain about what he's talking about. You've always got me. And then, you know, there's some romance bits and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, uh, he says, I love you too, Captain, which is like their code word for each other. And she, and she, and then ends, her perspective says, I, and I gasp as my mind and vision erupt in startling incandescent white. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this kind of mirrors what happened earlier with Contorius. And, you know, with, with Quint, you can think like, oh, well, he's not, he's never planeswalked before. He wouldn't know what it is. But Frasca and Jace are much more experienced planeswalkers. Yeah. So maybe this is something different. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, we, I do think it's something different mm-hmm. because, uh, though, yes, the hemoelectric switch is what they call it. Yes. <laughs> I love Ravnica. Yeah. Luckily, luckily, we just had these blood microwaving devices. Yeah. But there's no trace of Vraska's body. Mm-hmm. They can't, they go back to get her body, but they, it's gone. Mm-hmm. What could have happened to Vraska? That is the only time we see Jace is appearing in Vraska's side story. Yeah. I think they're okay. I think Ixalan is for lovers. Probably. That's my official... Yeah, that's when we my go back to the, the, what is it, the Lost Caves of Ixalan? The Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Yeah. <sighs> you, know, you know where I think Quintorius would be good? Going around in caves yeah. like he already yeah. does? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking, you know, do, doing archaeology stuff. Yeah. We're going to totally get a card where Quintorius is just like, you know, stroking his chin while he looks at a at a statue on a pedestal. Yeah. 
<laughs> Be, uh, hopefully he doesn't just, he just catalog stuff and doesn't take things back to Arcavios, though. Yeah, yeah. He, he yeah. leaves their beautiful things alone. Moving on, episode eight, Ren and eight. Ren bonds with world with uh, Realm Breaker after considerable difficulty, but she doesn't bond with the Frec with Realm Breaker. She bonds with the tiny sap, the spirit of the sapling of the original world tree. Yeah, that's that's inside of it, and yes. she describes him as him being very like timid and scared. Right. Yeah. And so she finds him, and then she's like, "No, I got you, Boo." And mm-hmm. she, uh, she also gets a thorough inoculation from a wounded and very ill-looking malaria before mm-hmm. she does this. Right. So she's covered in like the phyresis prevention goo, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, malaria can unphyrexinize someone when given enough time, right? Because mm-hmm. she says in the one story that she could have fixed Nahiri if Nahiri had bothered to get fixed. Right. That's very Nahiri, though. Um, but uh, so, you know, they so she she finds the actual spirit of the world tree that's hidden within Realm Breaker and bonds with that and gives it all of her energy. And she can tell that she d- describes this as like basically uh, turning her body to ash. She has released the fire that is inside mm-hmm. her uh, and she's controlling Realm Breaker and she reaches out and finds and basically explosively grows the tree. And she finds all of these different planes and finally finds Zelfir, which yes. is off in its own bubble, like way separate. And is like, um, I need you to come here. And she connects the two. But mm-hmm. Zelfir is like in this little area of like negative energy. Because it's not just a plane sitting by itself that yeah, you can't it's... reach. It's like, it's got like some sort of like repellent field around it. And somehow the act of connecting these two planes doesn't just put a portal to Zalfir and bring it back Mm -hmm. it kind of swaps it's like it's like got like a it's like a vacuum and it starts sucking new Phyrexia into where Zalfir was and Zalfir starts going into where new Phyrexia was so they kind of like exchange places in the multiverse is my read on that Mm -hmm. and then she names the tree eight after she's pretty keen about that it has a name and then uh, there's this big portal in Zalfir and they're like what's over there they're like oh war Mm-hmm. Good. We've been training for this. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. This is the thing that we've been waiting for. Yeah. All our legends speak of the time that we will be called to war, and war is here. Uh, so that happens, and then we get. Let's see. Then there's two side stories that are kind of important, which is the New Capenna story, mm-hmm. which is Atraxa is still running around a New Capenna. We find out New Capenna has not been doing well. Uh, the maestros are basically all gone. Anello has fallen to the Phyrexians, mm-hmm. uh, but we see from Aaron's point of view that uh, the rest of the uh, families are kind of working together, and the Riveteers doing the hard union jobs, <laughs> yep. you know, the physical labor that nobody else wants to do, uh, decide that the best way to kill Traxa would be to drop the entirety of Parkites on her. Hmm. And They make a compelling argument. Yeah, it happens, and uh, that's exactly what they do. Meanwhile... On Ravnica or on Zendikar, things are going pretty badly mm-hmm. uh, for Zendikar. Uh, we don't see too much of what's happening, but basically, Nahiri goes and takes over the Skyclave and is trying to sh- reshape the Hedrons to like channel the energy of New Phyrexia down. Mm-hmm. So Rav- uh, Zendikar gets really messed up. Yeah. Because it's got like more connections to Realmbreaker and stuff. And yeah, she tries to use the royal. Yes. To to reshape Zendikar. Yes, and uh, to to make it more Phyrexian, because Nihiri is completely brainwashed mm-hmm. by the Phyrexians. There's no Nihiri in there. Uh, but then something happens at the end. Uh, let me see if I can skim to the the most important part. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Before Nahiri can unleash her attack, there's a thundering, deafening crack from deep within the sky cr- skyclave. Something is going on. A so look of surprise flashes across from the planeswalker's face before everyone, including Nahiri, is knocked from their feet. And they see, they mention that there is that while this is happening, Nahiri has this look of like, what the hell is going on? She looks down, she, just, she see she doesn't have hands anymore. Mm-hmm. She's got mm-hmm. swords for hands, but yes. then it, like, it's gone. Um and whatever was happening, whatever this whole thing that was going on that Nahiri was sort of reshaping, all collapses on her and she basically gets crushed. Uh, and uh, so whatever happened is 
changes things. The uh, the Emiric Skyclave falls to Earth, the corrupted planeswalker trapped within. Uh, Acri looks up. Zendikar's sky is no longer red and greasy. Now it glows with a soft iridescent light. The, uh, the, the odds are stacked against them. They have found the slimmest of hopes. And with it, she and her friends will fight to save their home. Mm-hmm. So that is so something is happening on Zendikar. What is happening on Zendikar? Oh my goodness. Well, episode nine. We're really we're really getting to the end here. Um, back to New Capenna. Yeah. Which uh, w- is told from Giada's point of view, a brand new angel. Um, and we talk about the history of New Capenna and that they sort of confirm that they drop Park Heights on Atraxa, which I think is really funny, honestly. Uh, and uh, Giada sees through all these portals mm-hmm. that something's happened to Realmbreaker, where like the tendrils are receding yes. because now Ren has done her thing. As the tendrils recede, Giada and all the other angels of New Capenna are like, all portals point to New Phyrexia right now. Mm-hmm. Get them. Charge. Yeah. Actually, the, not all portals point to New Phyrexia. That's wrong. Basically, all the angels of of New yeah. Capenna flood out to all of the other planes to protect all of the other people. Um, and Zalfir comes and invades New Phyrexia, and uh, Teferi stops time so they can, you know, fight them and stuff like that and, mm-hmm. and do okay. And they're covered in, like this like boon of like angel juice that flows throughout yeah, the universe yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Halo. Yeah. They're, they're, they're covered in like halo energy. Um, and, and they're able to actually fight back, fight back the Phyrexians and the Zalfirans show up. They're doing great. They're covered in protective halo. Uh, Vorinclex tries to kill Teferi. He gets beheaded by Elspeth. Uh, it's all very exciting that mm-hmm. they talk about, and now the issue is, as this, as Zalfir and New Phyrexia are kind of trading spots in the universe, it's not going well for New Phyrexia because it's being smushed down into a much smaller spot. Yeah. So New Phyrexia is literally being crushed mm-hmm. as we speak, and Zalfir is kind of expanding out. Um, so the the roof of the Sanctum cracks. Ren's work to fairy wagers. As Zalfir moves to take New Phyrexia's place in the multiverse, New Phyrexia is cracking under the pressure. Structures tear and break. Slabs of metal plummet down. Zalfir and wizards conjure the winds to redirect the boulders out towards the enemy. No amount of Phyrexian armor can protect against the forces of mass and gravity. Smears of black oil are all that remain of those sm- squa- uh, squashed beneath. Distant towers topple. Monuments shatter. Vats creak and oil slick the walkway the ground rumbles beneath teferi's feet like the whole plane is collapsing at this mm-hmm. point and there's this huge battle going on basically in elish norn's like throne room uh and then uh this is this is very fun from elish norn uh teferi finally sees her and she looks way worse for wear uh and she screams what we've done what i've built will last forever <laughs> uh yes and uh, so Teferi, so she all gets attacked and stuff like that. And then she gets really mad uh, because all of the soldiers are trying to fight. Like all of her mm-hmm. soldiers are trying to fight the Zalfirans and she is just being attacked as one of them. And she goes, why aren't any of you protecting me? I am Phyrexia. Mm-hmm. Which is like, no, you're not. And we've finally, they've been undermined by their own free will, haven't they? The army hears her, and the army stops, but only enough for their own general to speak up. Jin Gataxis rides atop a massive war machine. Long and narrow, it is bedecked with all matter of weaponry. Blah, 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 blah. He's got a vat of his own newts. He's trying to get out with the kids, and he says to her, Your ego is a tumor on whatever talent you may have had. New Phyrexia has evolved beyond you, but your scraps may serve some use. Hmm. I love that the writer here, because she doesn't have a lot of time to do characterization, all of the dialogue is very flavorful. Yeah, she yeah. really tries to make sure that people's dialogue really expresses their character, which I find is a great shorthand hmm. for like because we don't get enough we don't get enough time to build all these deep psychological profiles, but we get these sort of Coles Notes versions, which I find good. Yeah, I I, I find the the writing actually fairly disciplined in that the characters, um, even though you're jumping between characters quite a lot and perspectives quite a lot, the writer has clear like, uh, um, 
a, a very solid understanding of how to write each one mm -hmm. so that you never quite get lost. Yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, yes, Jin Kataxis, this is how he speaks. This is right. what he would do. Elish Norn, this is how she speaks. This is what she would do. Uh, and then for, and then a Johnny comes back and he actually looks like he's been quite beaten up. So I don't know what's been going on on Theros, but probably nothing good. Uh, and a Johnny comes back to fight on behalf of Elish Norn. And Jin Kataxis and Elish Norn are fighting. So now it's a three-way fight. Zalfirian's killing any Phyrexian. It's not good. And, and Teferi's like, well, let them fight, dot meme. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, the Zalfirians are like, well, never let an opportunity go to waste. And he's like, wait, take that one alive. And they subdue a Johnny. They freeze him in ice mm -hmm. and drag him off, which I think is very interesting. And we'll find out more about that later. And uh, then... Yeah, Elspeth cuts like puts her sword through Nissa's head. Yeah. To 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 take her out. And uh and Elspeth doesn't deal the killing blow to which to Elish Norn, which I think yeah. is kind of good, honestly. Yeah. Uh it comes down to Karn. Yeah. Deciding that, you know pacifism is is um he is a pacifist. He doesn't want to inflict harm, but, you know, there's a calculus to that. Yeah. How much harm is he inflicted by not wanting to inflict harm? Yeah. And asking so asking somebody else to kill somebody for you is still doing them harm. Yeah. So he kind of figures he has to take it to his own hand. But basically, New Phyrexia is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and they are actually no longer able to hold the portal open any longer. And so Teferi is using all of his magic time stuff to like hold it open for long enough to get everybody in the last few surviving Mirans out mm -hmm. and uh, they take a Johnny and Nissa's bodies with them um, presumably and and Karn uses his his last few seconds on uh, New Phyrexia to sort of reassemble himself as best as he can and turn Elish Norn into a red smear mm -hmm. essentially yeah they show some card art of like him holding her disembodied head but it's but when they describe it, it's more like she's been she's got no legs anymore. Yeah, all of her bone armor is gone. Like she's just like thin pits of sinew and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, Karn gets rid of her, and that's the end of that story. Yeah, uh, and then we have the aftermath, which is mostly a, a huge part of it is Teferi finds a single acorn in Ren's ashes. Mm -hmm. Plants baby Groot. Yeah, essentially. Um, you know, it, 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 this is the story I think I like the most, where mm -hmm. it, because the pressure is off to get major plotline stuff done, and so you have a lot of people thinking about, you know, what things mean and what their relationship to other people is, um, that I, I enjoyed. It felt like this was finally the author giving a bit of space, given a bit of space to breathe and tell us a bit about these characters rather than like, okay, this person has to do this, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you get a lot of like Koth being kind of resentful that Nyssa and Ajani get to be saved. Yeah. Um, and like recognizing that that resentment isn't good. And yeah, he's still going to feel that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah yeah the, the bit of interrogation where he's he thinks like oh this isn't this isn't gracious this isn't good it's not going away no yeah yeah now uh, we're all gonna have to deal with this uh koth is also like doesn't like zelfir that much mm -hmm. he describes the this fabrics is too soft and the earth is too spongy and you know it's all too yeah. like everything is too moist <laughs> yes exactly he's used to a very dry climate yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh Malaria also is not doing very well. Her yeah. she got she she got a horrible wound just kind of pressed on through it and it's gone bad and she's beyond the level of even magical saving, which I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Considering Elspeth's an angel here, but I suppose anyhow, Malaria in her like sort of dying maybe it's easier to save a planeswalker than it is a yeah, human life. I, yeah, it feels like I mean, you're able to save basically everyone else, but okay, I guess Malaria's wounds are... Yeah. Malaria's just a normal person, though. Yeah. She's a normal Mirren. She has no magical power. She just has, like, weird blood that fights Phyresis. Mm -hmm. um, so she, uh, she, her wound has turned bad and cannot be saved, and so she uses the last of her strength to try and heal Ajani and Nyssa, who are... So, and then 
Karn is going to do a thing where he tries to cleanse their sparks, and he's also going to burn out his own spark while he's at it because he's sick of being a planeswalker in this life entirely. Mm -hmm. Karn just needs to lay down for a while. Yeah, yeah. So they sort of use the last of Malaria's magical power, and they use Teferi's time magic and all sorts of other things going on. To try and uh, to try and make this work, and they heal a Johnny and Nissa, and a Johnny's spark comes back, but there's something wrong with Nissa's. Mm -hmm. Even in Teferi's slow motion uh, world, it's yeah. like quickly shaking itself apart. Yeah, and it's like burning. Some, it's, like there's ash falling off of it. Yeah, it's it's decaying somehow. So there's something wrong with Nissa's spark, which I think is interesting, um, and uh, and yeah. And then they heal them, and and this is the and this is that they they heal them, and then after a really tense moment, Chandra wakes up, or uh, Nissa wakes up and says Chandra, uh, and they finally get their kiss after so many years. I'm right here, Chandra says. She presses her lips to Nissa's. I'm right here, and I'm not going anywhere. Good, Teferi thinks everyone else also thought that yeah <laughs> he won't be going anywhere for a while either so teferi's happy they've planted a wren acorn mm -hmm. there's something wrong with this is spark jason this uh, jason vraskar nowhere to be seen koth is super traumatized kai is pretty oh right we forgot kai also just randomly shows up on theros and just knifes heliod in the neck yeah you know i guess you gotta kill a god send a spirit assassin yeah, I don't know how she decided she needed to go to Theros, but maybe she thought about it for a bit and was like, mm, maybe we'll find that out later. There's a whole yeah. aftermath set coming yeah, in like yeah, six exactly. weeks or something. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my, my thoughts on these are largely unchanged. I prefer the side stories because they get to be much more comfortable mm -hmm. and interesting. And uh, the main story arc it feels very rushed um, and it spends a lot of time jumping back and forth between characters. And I think the author here does uh, K. Arsenault of... Oh, I forget her name. I'm going to make sure I, I, I say it perfectly and correctly. It is K. Arsenault Rivera. Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel the writing here is quite disciplined in that it does put a lot of effort into making sure that these otherwise quite jarring jumps between characters don't leave you behind mm -hmm. um because each character does have kind of a very clear voice and personality um but these are very like plot centric um the characters feel like they're being dragged along and i think that's just kind of the nature of this kind of storytelling yeah the side stories where people get to have thoughts and feelings are great yeah um i think I think I think that I think that's a little bit of a reduction. I think there's I think there is as many thoughts and feelings that could be put into this as the word count and yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. This is not this is not like writing a novel where no. you write the plot until you have written the plot and you write the feelings until you've written the feelings. There's a word count to hit for these articles. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of plot points that need to be put in. And I think that given those constraints, I think this is really good. I think this is much less rushed than the than the one story. Mm -hmm. Like as quickly as this moves along, the one story also like went along at a very fast pace. This one I felt had a bit more space to breathe. I, I'm I would, I, sure, this could have been better in 12 parts or yeah. 15, yes. but I think, thank God they wasn't any less than 10. Yeah. Right? This is, it was as short as they possibly could have made it. Yeah. Uh, and I loved, I loved the amount of magic story we got. I mm -hmm. think between all of this stuff, uh, we got enough to understand what was going on and get, get some good resolutions for characters or non-resolutions as it may be and other things. And uh, I uh, I also really like the fact that the story came out before the cards came out. Yes, agreed. Agreed. I, I, I like having this context for the cards as they're being spoiled. Yeah. And me too. I think it's effective to inter or like to, to have the art for upcoming cards um, you know, as key art for these stories because it kind of invites you to speculate on what, you know, the cards will be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. How could this, what's this moment? Yeah, we know how, that, how are we going to represent this? I know that this um, is Tamio being sliced in half by the Wanderer. This is probably going to be a white removal spell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, right, like, like oh, of... yeah, here's the, here's the white plus two plus O oh and everyone gains vigilance spell. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I just, I like that because sometimes it's hard to like when the story is not coming out, but you see cards that represent later, or the story is still happening, mm -hmm. and you see cards that represent something way later, and there's flavor text, which is, I know from my own personal experience, is sort of written in a separate but connected manner to the main story, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, so you want, so it's sometimes they don't entirely 100% agree, mm -hmm. right? Or it might be representing something a little bit out of, like, out of the timeline of where you are. And you're like, well, now I've just had a major plot point spoiled for me. Like, yeah. that I don't like. Would, and so, you know, or sometimes when you see the cards way before the story, it's like, I don't even, like, okay. Yeah. I know what's happening here, and all of the dramatic impact has been sucked out for me. Uh, so I loved having the story out first, so the people who are big Vorthoses can find out what happens and care about the story and be hyped for what happens in the set and then see these things happen on the cards. Yeah. I liked it, Wizards. Do that more. Keep doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think this this model works well. Um, you know, as for the, 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 the actual arc of the story... Um, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the way this plays out entirely. It's like all the things that we thought were going to happen happen. <laughs> I mean, which is fine. It's fine. Can you say you've ever been just, uh, uh, surprised by a Marvel movie? No. No. Absolutely no. never. I've never been surprised. <laughs> yeah. This now. This is coming from somebody who literally called. Uh, I would say a couple of major plot points, uh, mm -hmm. having no inside information mm -hmm. into what was going on. But I've seen Marvel movies and I've read books and I'm like the Cassandra of TV plots. Like it is my curse to know to be the Oracle mm -hmm. there, um, which is why I like watching things like Taskmaster, because that defies any kind of logic or storytelling. Right. Right. But the point being, this is just something like I... As a big story where lots of things happened and things got blown up and things got changed and many places got stomped on and wrecked, but not in a way that they're completely broken forever, but maybe they're changed a bit to keep the setting interesting. I can see exactly why they did the things they do and why they told the story like this. Because somebody a few years ago said, oh, Endgame was real popular. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I think they did a fine job. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Lots of people enjoyed it. I'm just a curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Which is making it sounds like I'm very negative on it. I kind of liked it. I like that they left Jason Vraska ambiguous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually I would say that's not even like super ambiguous. They they go off together somewhere, yeah. and we'll meet them again in for their adventures. Yes, good. Um, that's just because I like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they're. I finally like Jace. Yeah, I, I'm actually all for Jason Vraska going off and having uh, interplanar adventures as like a totally functional and supportive married couple. Yeah, who, are, just, who are like completed in some way. Yeah, they <laughs> like, complete or, each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but shall we wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the, this podcast has been brought to you by cardkingdom.com slash uh, go to cardkingdom slash LRR. Uh, if you make a purchase there, tell them Loading Ready Run sent me button, please. And they will include a little one-inch button with your order that says my dex power level is yes. Yeah. Um, this podcast is also brought to you by you, the viewers over at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Without your support of this podcast, uh, it wouldn't happen. So thank you. 